Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. Well, the term Anglo-Indian first referred to the British in India, um, but from the Indian census of 1911, it came to refer to a community of mixed descent. Well, the history goes back a long way. In fact, uh, almost 500 years uh, since the Portuguese arrived in India. When the British established their factories, such as the one in Madras in 1639, um, they were very much outnumbered by Indo-Portuguese. The East India Company was formed in 1600, went out to trade in India. Um, in fact, largely because the Dutch had increased the price of pepper by five shillings a pound. Port St. George is the starting point. Once the port came in, lot of soldiers came from Britain to Madras, the then Madras presidency. In 1687, they decided to encourage marriages between their European employees and Indian women. And in order to make that a bit sweeter, they offered them a gold pagoda. Now that all changed very dramatically, really, um, from the late 18th century for a number of reasons. And one of those was in 1791, the uprising in Santo Domingue, which is now Haiti. Now a series of acts and edicts barred uh, new Anglo-Indians recruits from the covenanted ranks of the civil service and from every rank of military service. With the severe restrictions that were placed upon them, the Anglo-Indian community became faced for the first time with the concept of poverty, really. Post uh, the 1857 mutiny, there was a major restructuring of administration and uh, how the empire was run. The crown took over the administration of uh, India. They also went out of their way to create certain enclaves uh, so that these people whom they felt slightly guilty about having created could make a living. Darjeeling became the queen of hill, hill stations and of course they needed people to run the DHR or the Darjeeling Himalayan, the toy train. And who better than the Anglo-Indian community to do it? And these were all managed and designed and worked by the Anglo-Indian community. There's scarcely any mention of the community's contribution, and this is a shame. Bishop Henry Cotton, who was the Bishop of Calcutta, preached a sermon in St. Paul's. And he preached that the, these people who had been suppressed and who gave their blood for Britain, the least we can do is in order to uplift them, is to give them education. The association did petition the Secretary of State in Britain on matters that affected them. In fact, uh, Sir Henry Gidney, who was at the helm in the 1920s, did visit England in 1923 and 1925 after the Montague Chelmsford reforms, which really did away with you know, exclusive favours for anglo indians But he met with little success. McCluskey Gunge was a big dream of Mr. E.T. McCluskey, who wanted to have all the Anglo-Indians settled in one place so that they could call it their homeland or Moluk. This dream started in 1934. These people formed a body called the Colonization Society of India, registered at the Stock Exchange in Calcutta. The idea was to, to encourage them to get over there, to buy the plots of land, put up their houses, and do farming. Frank Anthony was a lawyer, and he felt that uh, he knew the direction that our community should head in. But let us always remember that we are Indians. The community is Indian. It has always been Indian. Above all, it has an inalienable Indian birthright. Many of the community feared that when the British went back home, the Indians would have revenge and would uh, retaliate. Post-independence was a time of um, great worry for Anglo-Indians because they didn't know what was going to happen to them. I think it was to do with the culture and the future of your children. The greatest contribution to education in India has been from the Anglo-Indian community. So I think even though 
there's uh, a minuscule community like ours, but our contribution to India was immense.